back to Truck Tech, everyone. You know, this week in Salisbury, North Carolina, we're getting a look at something that doesn't really involve electrification. It doesn't involve autonomy, but it does involve natural gas. And what's interesting about this is we may be looking, and if you listen to people like Cummins, we may be looking at what could be a breakthrough in terms of powering uh, trucks uh, in, in the coming days. We're going to spend some time today going through the plant here that uh, uh, Hexagon Agility has in, uh, in Salisbury, where they are making the tanks and the uh, systems that go into natural gas trucks. They're also expanding this uh, facility. And we'll, so we'll spend some time with Eric Bippus, who's the executive vice president on the commercial side of Hexagon Agility, talking about all the things that go into getting these trucks, and especially the Cummins 15 liter uh, natural gas engine that's uh, coming this year, ready to take advantage of what could be a breakthrough really in natural gas after years of just being sort of a one or two percent player. Hope you enjoy it. I'm here with Eric Bippus. He is an executive vice president of the commercial operations for Hexacon Agility here in Salisbury, uh, North Carolina. You know, Eric, this is kind of a, been a fun morning because we've had a chance to go through the plant as it exists now, what you're making for natural gas. Uh, what's behind us, of course, is what's coming next. Why don't we start there and you can hear what's happening. Yeah, yeah, no, glad to have you. Uh, welcome to North Carolina. So we're really excited. Uh, the future is great for compressed natural gas. So, um, we're getting ready to expand our facility here uh, be in full production by January of next year. Um, and it's really around getting ready for the heavy duty trucking industry adopting the Cummins 15 liter compressed natural gas engine. Right. Now, this fuel agnostic program that, that, uh, uh, that Cummins has undertaken yeah. starts with natural gas this year. Yeah. They'll, they say they'll deliver a trash switch this year. They've got some significant orders. They also have made a pretty interesting projection about natural gas. You know, it's, it's one of those things that's a technology that kind of bounces one, two percent uh, along the way. I've heard, and, and Jose Sampero has said, the, the head of on the highway for Cummins, this could be a 10% player. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're hearing. and that's what we're seeing from the fleets. It's been very good feedback. This is an engine that has been used at, well, over a million miles in China already. So this is technology that is, that is advanced, it's mature. Um, and when you look at today's heavy duty truck fleet, 97% of all heavy duty trucks going on the road today are still diesel. So when we talk about 10%, 10% of a 300 to 350,000 truck market is quite significant for us. Well, and of course we spend a great deal of time on truck tech talking about electrification and talking about what electric trucks are coming and things like that. You have actually sort of broken up a, a chart this morning that you shared with us, I thought was very interesting, which sort of shows use cases, you know, by, uh, by size, if you will. And of course, we've got fuel cell in there. We've got a, a battery electric in there. But you're really advocating now. It's interesting because we're getting some sort of shifting away from, uh, you know, the rush electrification mm -hmm. and into uh, alternative fuels. You know, there's obviously H2 ice is being discussed, hydrogen right. combustion. Uh, natural gas has been here, but is this its moment? Is that what's coming? Yeah, we really, we really believe that. Uh, when you look at all, we have a multi-technology strategy, as you said, fuel agnostic. Uh, we firmly believe that there's a place for multiple clean energy solutions to decarbonize light commercial vehicle, medium duty, heavy duty long haul, refuse space. We feel that there's a multiple solutions. Battery technology is already proving out that in the lower range city type routes, it works quite well. We expect hydrogen to have a place as well. You got pretty good energy density with hydrogen. But when you look at today's heavy duty fleet, these long haul fleets that are going out three, 400 miles out one way and coming back or hauling 80,000 pounds, that requires a significant amount of energy. And today it's not just the vehicle that you have to think about. It's the grid and infrastructure to support a clean energy solution. So we may have vehicles that are ready. Is the grid ready? Can the grid handle 10,000, 20,000 trucks charging in the LA metro area today simultaneously. So that's why we believe natural gas with a great infrastructure, with great availability of a renewable natural gas that's in the North American market today, and OEMs that are offering the product, it's ready to go. Well, and there's a, a different sound with the 15 minute you pointed this out earlier, and I, I think it's true, and that is we're not dealing with a, 
sort of the limitation, the power limitations that right. the 12 liter, which is going to be phased out over time, um, has, uh, you know, in terms of horsepower and torque, you actually get some pretty good numbers. I had 500 horsepower, and I can't remember the torque number off the top of my head. But enough that people can look at this, the fleets can look at this and say, you know, I can make that work. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's been one of the, the holdbacks on natural gas to, to receive more adoption. We've been limited to 400 horsepower. Uh, the, the comes 15 liter rings, but up to 500 horsepower if you're required, I think 1850 on torque, which is play you cover through those sleeper applications, heavy duty long haul. Also the efficient, efficiency improves, so that engine is not working as hard, you can operate at the peak performance in the torque curve, you need to do a good transmission. We're, we're really focusing on taking as much cost out of the fuel system as we can, so but this clean energy solution is readily adaptable. You gotta deploy it at scale. If we, if we do 10s and 20s, that's not going to decarbonize heavy duty trucking. We have to be able to deploy at scale. So the fleet needs, you know, a positive ROI. They need infrastructure availability. They need fuel availability. And another thing that's an advantage of natural gas, and especially renewable natural gas, is the fact that from a technician standpoint, it's an easy transfer. Spark ignited and compression ignited, very similar engines, applications, and the user friendliness from drivers is very, very diesel. Well, you, can, you can still basically have ways to the amount of time. Yeah. Now, you've talked about applications going up to 1,200 miles, which would be the true long uh, over the highway uh, kind of driver. Um, this is something that would uh, take in two of your products, basically. In current. One, one is the sort of the back of cab, yeah, four uh, cylinder. Pro cab 175, so that's a 175 diesel gallon, good one. Okay. And then side rails. Uh, Correct. Two more tanks, is that right? Two more tanks, 45 diesel gallon goes. Our pro rails that can go on the side, so you can get to. 265 diesel gallon equivalents. Okay, and that would take you to what, a thousand, about 1,200 miles? Absolutely, depending on your payload. You see, if you're hauling potato chips or something very light, you can probably go a little further than that. If you're hauling heavy steel, it may be a little bit less than that, but I would say an average of uh, 11, 1,200 miles. Natural gas, though, has had a bit of, I don't want to call it a stigma, but maybe that is the right word, that, you know, people say, yeah, that's okay for certain applications. And But now you've got some education, as does Cummins, as do the OEMs, I think, you know, in terms of, the, you know, the, what they're asking their dealers to sell. Sure. Uh, do you think there's going to be much in the way of education either that has to happen? I mean, you know, fleets tend to be pretty set in their ways. That's why electrification didn't get come out of gate card either. Right, right. Absolutely. There's going to be a lot of... Education, training, you have to, you know, one of the precious commodities that fleets have is their drivers and their technicians. They want to make sure that they feel safe. Do they know how to operate? Do they know how to service it? And we spend a lot of time on the training aspect of deploying new technology. So there's a level of comfort in doing that. Yeah, but you're, but you're not an outlier. I mean, you're close here in, in this part of North Carolina. You're close to the Dimers uh, uh, plant at uh, Cleveland, uh, yep. Uh, yep. North Carolina. I think uh, Mount Holly's yep. terribly far away. Yep. Um, so well, you, up the road. Yeah, so you got, uh, you've got quite a bit of, uh, of OEM customers uh, right around here. But, uh, now, now, these will get assembled here and built here, the systems will, uh, but they will get put on in different places. That's right. You know, Fontaine right. and others. How is that going to work? Uh, you know. Yeah, it's a good question. So typically we will have roughly one third of what we do. We'll get the truck to our facility, could be here in Salisbury or over at Ain Street where we do installations of our systems. Could be on the West Coast at our Fontana Rialto facility on the Californian. Um, or it could be a third party installer like a Fontaine that you said that's not necessarily a factory OEN. We can do it regionalized, we call them third party installers. The other option too is we are factory installed. So at Freightliner and Volvo, both of them do factory installs when it's higher production runs. So like a line signed, or if it was a specific fleet, say it was, oh, let's talk about signing of these. Yeah. If they were going to buy an intro gas, then maybe they brought all this to a batch. Exactly. That. Exactly. Yeah. For a batch. Yeah. 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 Okay. So what you're going to do that here, just return them. Yeah. Even if we polish them mm -hmm. for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> what you're going to do that here, though, is principally for these uh, larger uh, applications for the right. tobacco truck and, and, and the side rails. A lot of the other stuff is still in Lincoln, Nebraska. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So, but, but but bringing that work here because you've got so many oh, OEM customers literally up and down the East Coast, mm -hmm. right? Um, makes all the sense. Yeah. So what Lincoln is the number one manufacturer of Type Four composite cylinders globally. It's the largest consumer outside of aerospace of carbon fiber in that plant. 
One of the reasons we're doing the large diameter cylinders here is because it is for class eight trucking, the focus on and the, this particular plant does the backup cab, pro cab systems and pro rail for heavy duty truck. We do the installations here. So from an ESG standpoint, environmental standpoint, shipping those cylinders across the country, the more we can reduce that, the better. We're manufacturing everything under the same roof, cylinders on one side of the plant, systems, and then we install. So there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained from doing that. We're, we're getting rid of waste and logistics. Also, we're very proud of our vertical integration. So one of the things that we didn't experience during the, the supply chain crunch post COVID was supply disruption. We're, we're very regionalized, localized. We do a lot of our fabrication work in-house as well. So having cylinders in-house, plus our fabrication work and installation that allows us to be in control of that supply chain. The, the one thing I think you did touch that was a bit of a, a hiccup though, and that was chassis, skinny chassis. Yeah. You know, every yard is struggled with that. Yeah. You know, uh, you know uh, intermodal, everybody had, had issues to recover on chassis. That's getting better. It's getting better. We're seeing the OEMs really recovering. There's a couple little outlier areas where, where the, we still see issues, but we think by June of this year, the supply chain heavy duty truck should be completely recovered. Yeah, we're gonna take a quick look, uh, Eric, at uh, at, at Michelle Shiel, uh giving us a, just a quick air of what's happening down here. Then we can go back and we'll talk to you about RNG, uh, renewable natural gas, right. or biomethane, as it's also known, mostly in Europe. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, about how that is going to hopefully make the difference from a petroleum-based natural gas. Excellent, look forward to it. I'm with Michelle Scholl. She is the startup manager for Hexacon Agility's new expansion in Salisbury, North Carolina. Michelle, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Maybe you want to take us a little bit on what we're seeing. There's a lot of open space here. You're going to fill it up. Yes, so we are in our expansion. We have 113,000 square feet here that we just added on to our existing facility. And so what we're doing here is we're going to be creating our cylinders. So right now, most of our cylinders are sent from our facility in Lincoln, Nebraska, and soon we'll be able to make cylinders here as well. You come from Nebraska. You actually moved your family here so that you could uh, you could do this startup. Yes, so I've been with the company about two and a half years. And so then when I heard that we were starting up a facility here, making the same product that we make in Lincoln and expanding our capacity, I was very excited about the opportunity. So. I moved here about four and a half months ago, and it's been great so far seeing this go from dirt to a full building with walls up and lights on. And so I can kind of show you a little bit about what will be that goal. Well, let's do that. I can see right now that we've got a lot of open space to fill. Why don't you tell me what's going to happen? Yes. So the first phase of the project is actually just in these first couple quadrants here. And so we'll be ramping this up this year. Starting at the front, we'll have a welder which is pretty much all done by robots. And then here we'll have some cylinder winding. So that's where we have our product and we uh, put carbon fiber and resin to add strength to the tank. And then we have our testing back there. The need for this, the need for this plant is mostly due to what? Why do you need more capacity? So we have growing demand. And so the exciting thing is we have the 15 liter Cummins engine coming online. And so that will really help us expand our customer base and our upcoming plan. So that is the need for that extra capacity. So what else are we going to do in this uh, in this particular facility? We're going to we're going to uh, wind cylinders of carbon fiber and resin. We're going to ultimately produce them in here, right? Yes. So we will wind them. We will test them, and they'll ultimately be ready to be put on finished systems. And so this, what we have right here in these first couple of quadrants, this is just the first phase. We will have three total phases, this being the first, we'll put in a second, pretty much identical line to this, and then a third one a couple of years down the road. And what's standing over here under the white sheets? What are we looking at down here? What is this? Cure ovens. So after we're done winding our cylinders, they go into ovens to be cured, and that adds some additional strength to the crop. And then what else are you going to do down here? This is a very nice floor, very shiny, very nice. Thank you, thought brand new. What else are you going to do in here? So really, what we have here going on from the welder to the winder to testing, that's going to be what we have in here, just copied and pasted three times. And then you're going to take these cylinders and they're going to go into the main plant, yes. right? And where they will go into the builds for both the uh, back of cab and the side rails and things like yes. that. 
You'll make all sizes of cylinders here for all of the products? Right now the plan is to mainly make the 27 by 81 cylinders. So just like you said, the back of cab and a side mount. And so Link and Nebraska will continue to make the other sizes for now. Right. Now I understand over the next few years you'll probably add up to 80 employees yes. by the time you're by the time you're done. And that's on top of about 300 in, in the main plant. Right. Correct. So this is a, a big boost for this part of Carolina, but you're also very close to some of the customers, so especially yeah. for those uh, back of cab uh, units and things like that. Yes, we consider ourselves perfectly situated to help our customers in the best way. You know, it's interesting when we talk about renewable natural gas and we talk about biomethane, as it's done best in Europe, um, it's catching on in a big way. I think the numbers are like 98% of all the, uh, uh, the natural gas used in California is, is biomethane or is, you know, not petroleum based, but puts 64% of that country. Correct. Is that right? Correct. Where is that going to take us uh, in, in terms of, you know, the, the, the zero, net zero carbon impact of that? is meaningful. Again, big integration challenge you do? Yeah, it is. It is both from a, a fleet standpoint. The, you, a lot of fleets look at their trucks as their billboards and they want to, you know, impress upon the public, the, the consumer, that they're moving product very plainly. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is with renewable natural gas. So you see a lot of advertising out there just on the side of the trucks talking about that. But from a adoption standpoint, great, as you mentioned in California, great. 98%, 64% been growing. We do expect that as we ramp on trucks, that could be strained a bit as more renewable natural gas comes online and there's a lot of biodigestion taking place. Uh, WM has gone public on how they're producing renewable natural gas from their landfills. So instead of flaring, they're tapping that gas, processing it, putting it into the pipeline. We'll see more and more of that and some more of that taking place in Europe as well. So we're really excited about renewable natural gas. Well, there's some of the major players saying, uh, you know, I think Klaus says Trillium and, mm -hmm. and they're building uh, yeah. renewable natural gas, but it's like really the West, not just California. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm sure there are others. Uh, it, it, we're not going to run out of uh, source material for this, but dairy waste is pretty much a regular thing. Dairy waste is a regular thing. Human waste is a regular thing. Landfills are, are all over there. They're really untapped right now. So there's a lot of opportunity in that. And one of the myths out there is renewable natural gas is not taking a food crop and converting that into a fuel. Like an ethanol. Exactly. Ethanol. This is taking true waste that is emitting methane into the atmosphere where it's 25 times more potent than CO2 from global warming and capturing that methane, processing it, and then running it through a combustion. Mm -hmm. This, uh, it sounds almost too good to be true because actually in my past, I worked in the FNL space at, at GM when we mm -hmm. asked that, it, was it Go Green, Live Yellow, whatever it was, I can't remember. Right. But, you know, we watched as the food industry rebelled against ethanol yeah. and basically chilled that. And then it was green ethanol that was coming. But it was too hard to break the plants down. This doesn't have those characteristics. Uh, no, not at all. It's, it's truly decomposing matter that is emitting methane, they capture that methane through biodigestion, process it, and clean that and get it to pipeline quality. And that's what's used. So it's, it is not taking food, usable food, converting that. Right. Where are the pinch points? Where are the, 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 the struggle yeah. with it? There's got to be some. Yeah, I mean, availability, right? We're at 64% uh, nationwide on usage and a relatively small percent of, of total trucks being using it. So as that grows significantly with the 15 liter, we need more renewable nat natural gas to come online. Now, there, there's, you mentioned uh, uh, LUPS. Uh, we've got Opal Fuels, you've got Trillium, you've got Chevron, you've got Clean Energy, all of them in that space from an infrastructure standpoint, but also accessing a renewable natural gas getting to the point. So, are we, I think the last number I remember in terms of the public stations was about 700, I think was the number I've heard mm -hmm. around natural gas stations. Are we going to need to see that come up? I, I don't know if the number is 100 or 70,000 gasoline stations, but I don't know if we need that many, but we're going to need more public stations, are we? Yeah, for sure. There's no doubt about it. We'll need more. We'll need more private. To, so if you add the private, there's about 1,700, 1,680, I think, public and private stations across the United States. That will need to grow. One of the things that we're trying to fill the gap in is have longer range system. So we mentioned the, you know, thousand plus mile uh, back of cap, pro cap system and pro rail system. 
allowing you to cover much, much bigger gaps, but certainly there's going to have to be a lot of infrastructure work that is going to take place. Mm -hmm. And we talked about education, uh, you know, getting fleets. Uh, but is this something that, that your company is doing, is, is doing the education and, and helping people understand why this is something that should be considered? You know, uh, obviously the sustainability is a lot of times being pushed by the customer, the end customers. That's right. No, I want you to fix my problem. That's right. That's right. No, there's not a lot. Uh, we have what we call a CNG Academy where we do training, whether it be for a new fleet that is just adopting compressed natural gas from a technician standpoint, driver standpoint, safety standpoint, all the features and benefits that natural gas bring. We spend a lot of time and a significant effort on training fleets. Right. right. In fact, this facility here, we have a training room down there. OEMs will bring dealers will bring fleets to this facility for training quite frequently. Mm -hmm. Very good. Eric, thanks you so much for being part of the truck day. Hey, appreciate it, Alan. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Pippus and Michelle Scholes definitely know what's happening over here. And now you have a better feel of what's going on on the, on the uh, natural gas preparation for heavy-duty trucks. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.